I am a black woman in the United States of America, and I understand my assignment. There has never been a time in our nation's history where I have been at the top of my government's list of priorities, but my assignment is to keep fighting like my mother and my grandmother and my great-grandmother before me, like Fannie Lou Hamer and Shirley Chisholm and Stacey Abrams, my job is to work towards a more perfect union within a very imperfect system. As a black woman, I do not have the luxury of giving up on democracy. I don't have the luxury of saying none of this matters. I don't have the luxury of claiming both parties are the same while enabling nefarious anti-democratic forces to take root and snuff out the hard-won victories that we've achieved over the last 100 years. I don't have the luxury of playing footsie with demagoguery in the name of contrarianism. None of that benefits me or anyone that I care about. I was able to attend the DNC in Chicago this year, and once I got past the discomfort of being surrounded by the type of fanaticism that resembled my evangelical upbringing a little bit too closely, I was able to take in some of the messaging around what the Democratic Party purports to stand for in 2024. Like any political party, the messaging of the Democrats has shifted to fit the times. The coalition needed to secure a Democratic victory this year will necessarily be broad. There was no shortage of gun-toting, reproductive rights restricting, racism-denying Republicans in the building, all hedging their bets that maybe, just maybe, this nice black lady would save them from the big bad bully. And frankly, I hope they're right. It's not lost on me that Kamala Harris has been ushered into this nomination, sandwiched by two gray-haired white men, one of whom had to essentially anoint her as his successor in a time frame that doesn't really allow for a whole lot of hand-wringing or dissent. The Democratic Party as a whole understands what it's up against, and they know that they don't have a whole lot of time for infighting. And that doesn't make Kamala any less qualified for the job, but it does stop a whole lot of needless lip flapping, and it requires a lot of progressive folks to push past their own biases and put their support behind someone that they had underestimated for far too long. This nomination really couldn't have happened any other way, and I think we all know that. I was honored to be in the room the night that Kamala Harris accepted her nomination. I sat there in my white, surrounded by jaded journalists and a couple of Republicans seated behind me who heckled the proceedings relentlessly. Though it wasn't lost on me that by the end of the night, they had become significantly less heckly. Maybe it was all the references to American militarism. Maybe it was Kamala's cute little nieces teaching them how to properly pronounce her name. Maybe it was Adam Kinzinger. Or maybe it was the Dixie, the chicks. But somewhere along the way, I got the impression that those Republican hecklers got the impression that there might actually be a place in this party for them. Big tent thinking. That's what you need when you nominate a radical left-wing San Francisco liberal woman of color, right? And don't forget to sandwich her between two respectable old Midwestern white dudes. And while you're at it, it's probably best to avoid any mention of the historic nature of her candidacy. All that black woman talk is going to upset the folks in Poughkeepsie. I'm sure none of this is lost on Kamala Harris. Something tells me that she understands her assignment, too. And something tells me that the thing that she couldn't speak about that night may have had a lot to do with why Palestinian American voices were sidelined. Not because Democrats weren't ready to hear them. They were. Not because Kamala Harris herself is not prepared to shift U.S. policy in the Middle East. I think she is. But because that unspoken thing, that silent, unnamed, yet ubiquitous thing, Her womanness, her blackness, her otherness was already speaking so loudly. Because the minute those two Republican hecklers behind me heard even the most sanitized, conciliatory message from a woman in a hijab, Kamala's womanness, her blackness, that otherness would have been front and center in their minds. I don't envy Kamala Harris in this needle threading that she's having to engage in. It's literally an impossible task. And she's already lost the faith of a lot of folks, understandably. But I think her willingness to at least attempt to thread that needle in the first place will earn her the respect of a lot more people. I am a black woman, and I don't suffer under the delusion that my government is good. As an Oklahoman with native ancestry, genocide was the genesis of my existence in this nation. Yet, how many presidential candidates have we heard seriously address the need for reparations for the descendants of enslaved people in the U.S.? In the state where Sonia Massey was killed and with the governor of Minnesota on the ticket, was there any mention of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act? This government has been playing in black folks' faces for more than 250 years. But when I consider the impact that this government will have on the climate, on reproductive rights, on diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, on the Supreme Court, 
on the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, on Social Security, on health care, on LGBTQ rights, on education, on democracy itself, the choice before me becomes very clear. I am not confused. I am not wavering. And I am not second-guessing myself. As long as I am a Black woman in the United States of America, my objective will be clear. Keep fighting until you think you don't have any more fight left in you, and then fight some more. Like Fanny and Shirley and Stacy and my great-grandmother and my grandmother and my mother before me, I understand my assignment, and I'm going to keep on fighting.